Hey everybody, it's Mr. X Stitch here and I am back with another designer discourse video. Yes, it's part of an ongoing series where I interview cross stitch designers, people who produce the patterns and charts that we love and we explore their creative process, how they got to being a cross stitch designer, how they run their businesses and kind of whatever else takes our fancy really. Today I've got an absolute corker with you, but first be sure to check out the playlist here where you can find interviews with Maria Diaz, Melorize and Lord Libidan, all of which are fantastic in their own special ways. And don't forget to uh, like this video and subscribe if you want to keep up with uh, the next videos as they come out. Be sure to hit that notification button. Mm -hmm. So this time, yeah, fantastic interview with Jane Greenoff, founder of the Cross Stitch Guild, someone who has been producing cross stitch designs since 1983. And we have a superb talk all around the houses, really. Her story is amazing. You know, we take so much stuff for granted in terms of creating patterns using software, selling patterns online. Jane had to kick it old school with graph paper and phoning people and driving around businesses and stuff. And just, it's just a great conversation. I've known Jane for years. I absolutely love her. We have a great time. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's crack on. So my, I was thinking, what's my best question? <laughs> what I want to know from you is that you've, you've got this perspective. I mean, how long have you been, if you're part of the expression, in the game? Uh, I have been in the game since, well, the first thing that I've got in the cupboard with the date is 1983. Right. And was that like, yeah, so, so let's go back in time. And how, how did you come to, how did you become a cross stitch designer I'm in to the do first it. place. Mm. Okay, uh, we moved, we, I was a nurse and um, had been a nurse teacher and was looking to go back onto the wards because I had enough of the office really. Nurse there at the Royal Barks, which I didn't get, but I was told that the, there was a one coming up in the other side of the hospital, excuse me, <clears throat> and I probably would get that. Anyway, um, so I was poised to go into management, uh, but be on the wards, and I discovered I was pregnant. Right. And we were told we weren't having children. Uh, we, no, it was 50-50, both right. rubbish at it. So, so um, I was, you know, very sad about that, and, uh, and struggled with it, but, you know, thought, well, I'll, I'll just get another job. Anyway, then suddenly, out of the blue, I was on maternity leave and uh, I got a phone call on the 7th of May, 1981, uh, to say that we were moving to the Cotswolds. Bill had been told at lunchtime that he was starting at the Lloyds Bank in Letchlaid. Okay. That was it. So we, on my birthday, in fact, the 8th, we came over house hunting and he started his new job on the Monday. Right. As they did in those days. Mm hmm and um, we found a home, eventually moved in, uh, in, well, I don't know, a couple of months, I suppose. It was very quick, anyway. And um, so I'm here in the Cotswolds, knowing no one, and thinking, what am I going to do when I, go back, when I go back to work, which I will have to do, I suspect. And I always envisioned I'd go on night duty, right. or go into theatres, or something very different from what I'd done. Mm -hmm. I didn't see myself... Uh, really fitting in as a part-time staff nurse and outpatients. I was far too bossy. I felt <laughs> I needed to have a new line where I had to learn again. Anyway, and I went in and had coffee with my neighbour in the other half of our little cottage. And there was a sampler, uh, well, there was a piece of embroidery, I didn't know what a sampler was, on the back of the sofa, sort of lying there, like an antonym castle used to be in the old mm. days. And I went, oh, did you do that? Said, yeah, yeah, it was a kid. I did that. I said, well, are you going to frame it? And she said, well, it hasn't, it's not finished yet. It's, we've got to put another alphabet on. And I'm looking for the transfer on the fabric. <laughs> um, and I sort of looked at her and she said, well, you count from the chart. And it, to say that it was a light bulb moment. Right. I mean, I sat there. I mean, James was, I remember he was on the floor in a yellow, one of those all-in-one suits that have the feet in. 
Mm-hmm. With the little yeah. leather bottoms or whatever, and it mm-hmm. zipped up to here. It's bright yellow. So I'd gone in there first thing. I suppose I'd changed his nappy. I don't know <laughs> if you remember. And he sat there all morning playing right. with her little daughter while I did a strawberry. Okay. Badly. <laughs> Well, I mean, I've hunted for that strawberry because I kept <laughs> it for years because every time I did a WI talk, I would take it along. Yeah. It's my first piece. Anyway, so I was fascinated by this. So I went home fascinated and then she, the girlie, bought me uh, a sampler kit in an in a end, of, end of trading sale in, from Cheltenham as a present. So I just sat and did that for a week on linen. Mm-hmm. because that's what she gave me, didn't yeah. know anything different. And I suppose I'd almost finished it when she came round to see me to say, look, there's this lady, she had a copy of Woman's Realm mm-hmm. uh, magazine, and there was a girl in the letters page who started her business selling kits on uh, mail order. Right. And um, she said, why don't we do that? I'll design a new stitch him. So I approached my ever loving husband. He's known as Deep Arm, Deep ha- Deep Pockets, Short Arms. <laughs> okay. All right. He's teased unmercifully, but he was in a bank all his working life, you know. <laughs> and, well, until he wasn't. Um, and I mean, he's, you know, he'd seen people make fools of themselves with money and he was very, very cautious. Anyway, I s- said, we, I need 50 quid. Well, if you think my month's housekeeping was a hundred pounds, this right. was a lot of money yeah. uh, to start this business. And he said, yeah, right. I could have fallen off my chair <laughs> because we hadn't got 50 quid. <laughs> Very short, you know, new moved house, one car, living in a village with no buses, uh, you know, all sorts of complications of the move. And so that was it really. Uh, we, Chapel Samplers was formed. Mm-hmm with 50 quid each, a bank account, five meters of Cashel linen. No, it wasn't Cashel, it was Glen Shee linen. And some boxes of Anchor Stranger Cotton. So that was the beginning. She designed a sampler, I stitched it, and we presented ourselves to the local needle workshop, suggesting the retail price of 20 pounds and the wholesale price of 18 pounds. Okay. which doesn't work no, obviously as we all like know <laughs> that that is nothing like I mean just can you imagine we knew <laughs> nothing and we'd taken an advertisement in the Cotswold Life magazine without a picture which cost £28 this advert <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway the upshot of all this cut it a long story even shorter um, Jane just she's another Jane Mm-hmm. She decided it wasn't for her. So I bought her out. <laughs> okay. So the agreement was that I took the fabric, the design, the threads, and I started on my own. So I'd never drawn a cross stitch pattern. Mm. Um, so I borrowed a drawing board from a neighbour, and it was resting on two bricks on the dining room table. And I drew things in symbols. Mm-hmm. So I still don't know how I did that and cut out paper to stick on where I made mistakes and use Tipex. Yeah, good old Tipex. And that's how it was stuck, that's how it started. So was it, was it quite traditional to begin with? Let's be honest, let's put this out on the table. You've got a very traditional aesthetic. Yeah, And was it, that, was, that was kind of, that was just how that it was, started. Yeah, that was about wanting to have old, having discovered the sampler, Mm-hmm. And I was now looking in antique shops for them mm. and understanding what a sampler was and the history of these girls and boys who'd stitched them. I wanted to design some samplers. Mm-hmm. So the business was changed to Inglestone Samplers. Right. Inglestone was the house name mm-hmm. and samplers was what I did. That's how it started. Yeah. So yes, muddy colours, mm-hmm. traditional uh, colours. And of course, I learnt in the years to come that samplers were often quite bright, but just had faded. <laughs> right, yeah. So I'm designing yeah. things that are, when you look at the back, you think, really? Yeah. But anyway, th- that's really how it started. Was the design um, process something that came easily to you? Um, well, I'd, I'd been kicked off drawing and sewing classes at my secondary modern. 
Right. So I was there's a certain amount of learning going on. Mm. Um, brass neck comes into it too because <laughs> yeah. I can remember I had four designs, mm -hmm. no three designs, all taken from books on samplers. So there weren't nine, but the motifs were taken. Yeah. Um, from old samplers or from books on old samplers. I had an alphabet and a little sampler with a house on it, and another one that escapes me for the minute. And um, I went out with my kits in the car, so I had the car on a Friday. So pack the baby on the back seat in the in the car seat, and I could go selling for as far as I could go there and back with the child. Right. So it was very Cotswold based, mm. obviously. And I went out one day. This is the absolute truth. I went into a shop in Burford, Stowe, Morton and Marsh, Chipping Camden. I think that was it. And I sold them a, an exclusive design of something in their town, plus my three samplers in every shop. Wow. And I came home having never drawn a real life building in my life right. with uh, an order that the first one I tackled was Burford Church. Right. Now, Burford Church is the largest church in Oxfordshire. And there is nowhere other than a helicopter that you can get it all in a picture because it's in all the houses. Right. So I had to take lots and lots of photographs and stick them <laughs> together with sellotape. Amazing. So I did these designs and they went out at Easter. Right. And we delivered them in the car. And people paid me when I delivered them. So, that, you know, I still didn't learn much about the trade, really. <laughs> None of this 30 days if I get around to paying you department. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how it started. And I loved it, you know. I mean, it, people would say, oh, cool, you're a housewife, aren't you? Oh, no, no, no. And now I have my own business. Mm. You know, it didn't make any money. I mean, it was, and Bill, he, you know, made me have a proper business bank account and he supervised because otherwise I'd have taken, all, I took 800 pounds that day. Right. Which was so Not, exciting. Yeah, 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 I yeah. wanted to go shopping. <laughs> but, you know, it had to go back in the business to buy some more fabric. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it started. Excellent. And it was very exciting mm. then. There's no one else in the, in the market though. There was one other... Uh, British cross stitch designer in the trade, right? And that was Mames Muller, who was actually American, <laughs> and she lived in Bath with her husband. And they had a business called the Silver Thimble, right? And their designs were called Elizabeth Stewart designs after their daughter, and um, and um, she was very clever, lovely lady, Mames, mm. but she wasn't actually English. She was married to an Englishman, but there was nobody out there doing what I was doing. So, I mean, what, um, what the, was there? I mean, in terms of the, if, if people were needlework hobbyists, where were they taking inspiration? Well, they were, they were doing printed canvases. Right. Printed embroidery, printed right. cross-stitch. Uh, I mean, Needlewoman in London had closed long ago. I'd been in there, you know, when I was 12. Wow. I went into Needlewoman in Oxford Street or at Oxford Circus when I was 12 years old, fascinated by this two-story shop. Mm. but didn't and have didn't any money. All haberdashery and... And it was always, I mean, my memory is there was a great big shop window. I think it might be the Apple shop now. Right. You know, but it had embroidery frames with trammed canvases. Right. Because that was the other thing people did. And the, the people who had discovered cross-stitch, like my neighbour, were buying kits from Denmark, okay. Norway. Yeah. Really. Lenate and all those lovely replica samplers that they did. That's really where the stuff was coming in from. And this is predating the magazines and everything, right? There was yes, there was there was the Audrey Babington's Workbox magazine. I think that's uh, still kind of going, isn't it? Workbox? I think it's still there. But yeah. Audrey Babington did it herself. Right. I think she did the whole thing. Mm. Um, I believe the Embroiderers Guild embroidery magazine might have still been out there. Still going. Um, but, right. you know, Needlecraft magazine, when it was started by Future Publishing, was revolutionary. Mm. Absolutely revolutionary. 
And were you part of that from the start? No, or? not from the beginning. Um, I was, uh, we didn't advertise. Mm -hmm. um, and my approaches from future were all young, thrusting men. Right. Trying to sell me advertising space in something I'd never seen. Right, yeah, and yeah. And I was quite short, really. I just said, piss off, I'm busy. Mm. I'm working, <laughs> I'm designing. I, no, go away. Mm. I just was not interested. Um, uh, I was in one of the early ones in the first year. Um, and the thing that happened with, um, with the Needlecraft magazines that was so revolutionary for me was that they had a little kit on the front. Mm. And so a person, I'm going to say a lady, but this is not meant to be sexist, but yeah. they, you know, the majority of them are ladies. A lady came up to me, I was actually at Liberty demonstrating, and this woman walked up to me and said, can I show you something? And it was like she was about to offer me some dope or something. It was all <laughs> like this. And she said, is this right? And she got out a kit that she'd made from the front of Needlecraft magazine. I said, yes, fine. She said, are you sure? I said, yeah. Right. <laughs> and she went off and she was collecting. Now, she would not have gone into a needle workshop and shown her ignorance. Right. But she bought the magazine in Smith's. Right. And got it home. And in the privacy of her own home, without anyone knowing, she'd learned to count on fabric. Curious. So the business of having a... This was then, remember. I'm mm. not saying it would have the same effect now, but mm. at that point, the fact you could pick up a magazine in Sainsbury's or all the other supermarkets that are out there, mm. and you could take it home and without anyone having to ask anybody and feel silly, that's my take on it, really. Mm. And I've heard this so many times since. You know, if it hadn't been for the free kits on the front, I'd never have tried it. Yeah. Because I suppose it would have, with the, the rest of the patterns in the magazine, you still have to go and purchase some materials, right? And it's not like now where you can just do it via your phone. You'd have to go buy the There thing. was no internet, you see. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. needle workshops were still not plentiful. I mean, there's obviously more then than now. Mm. But you also have the situation where, in some cases, needle workshop proprietors could be distinctly dismissive. Right if you didn't really know what you were doing. Hmm. For instance, oh, you won't be able to work on linen. You need to have this Ada stuff. Nothing wrong with Ada, hmm. as you know. Yeah. But there is this temptation, and some ladies don't like being talked down to. Yeah. So to be able to purchase a magazine and a news agents, and then go home and sew something, just opened a door that didn't get opened before. Hmm. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that seems reasonable. I mean, it's the same with a lot of the technologies now. You know, they've, they've, yeah, reduced the barriers to entry. Yes. That's what it's all about. Isn't it? Exactly yeah. what it's all about. Mm. So your business then was very much you direct selling to shops. Did that just continue yes. to grow? Then did you? Was there a well, tipping point where suddenly you were like, because you said, well, I was doing a workshop in Liberties. So I mean, clearly. well, yes, th 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 there was a bit of a leap. Um, we were approached, this is, it's a bit of a long way around, we were approached by the Ehrman Tapestry Company, okay. who have shops in Kensington and do lots of marvellous embroideries, uh, mostly canvas work, and they approached me to do a sampler for them. And it was, um, there was a line drawing of it in a Thursday edition of The Telegraph. Okay. Uh, they didn't sell enough and didn't do any more. Um, but I was approached by um, a buyer, no, not a buyer, an, um, a publisher about doing a book. Right. And um, so that was one of the things that was sort of in the background. And then the Liberty thing happened. Um, it, it, it's going to make it sound like my husband doesn't let me do anything. Because it's absolutely <laughs> not true. He's you a lovely him. man. I've met him. He's a lovely man. He's a lovely, He's a lovely man. man. <laughs> um, but he has his reservations about things. Anyway, I wanted to sell in Liberty because I'd been there as a child. I'd been there as an adult. Mm. I loved the fabric. I loved the place. I loved the smell of the building. I mean, it was just, it was iconic, an iconic place. We're talking 30 odd years ago. And um, frankly, London department stores had appalling records for paying their bills. Right. Um, Horrid, as I'm afraid it is sometimes known in this house, were notorious 
-hmm. for not playing small suppliers. And so there was no way I was going to be able to play that game. Well, in the middle of all this, my father was going to be 60. Right. And it involved me changing stations in London to go and surprise him. I'm the eldest of five, and we were all converging. Mm -hmm. Which meant I had to get out of the station, change into a business suit, and call and see the buyer at Liberty. Um, Bill knew nothing about this. <laughs> I'd Imagine the situation, though. I'd run the buyer. She had answered her phone, one, which is unheard of. Mm -hmm. Two, I said that I was going to my father's birthday party and I had a bit of spare time and could spare her a few minutes nice. on this date. Yeah. She must have had a sense of humour that day <laughs> because she said, I'd love to see you. Well, it's never happened since, you that's, know. That's some slagger, I I, isn't it? <laughs> before I sold the business, I think I was on my 12th Liberty buyer, you know? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I went to see her unbeknownst to management. And I kept saying to myself, as I came into the store, this is brilliant, this is brilliant. I'm going to go behind the doors, Mark Private. Mm. That's actually what I want to do, go behind the doors, Mark. Yeah. I never thought that I was going to. Anyway, she looked at what I'd got, which wasn't much, five or six designs, I suppose. And she picked my hand up and said, come with me. And dragged me across the street to look at the building. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll buy your range if you do that for me. Okay. I said, okay. <laughs> uh, now and, you're red hot at doing buildings as well. <laughs> well, I've got quite good at buildings. Yeah. I also said to her, you know, if you want that done properly, it's, it's not, this isn't going to work. It's going to be enormous. No one's going to buy it. Why don't I do the front, get the gables and the clock mm -hmm. and the Liberty writing? And she let me see a drawing. So I did. And they, they took it. I had to sign an agreement that um, if they ever ceased trading, that I couldn't sell it myself. Right. You know, it was all very strict. So I designed the Liberty Sampler, which was in the shop window right. in Regent Street in those days when they had the Regent Street annex. And it was in the Christmas catalogue. And I was so excited. Yeah, I've still yeah, got yeah. a copy somewhere. That's so that's how I came to be in Liberty. Right. Quite early in the procedure, but it was a sort of a chain reaction, really. Mm. And then I did a little one of Liberty, which had, went in with the Big Bends and the Buckingham Palaces. I did all those um, little souvenir ones of London, mm. a red taxi, a guardsman, a telephone box. And they'd buy them in 50s. Mm. Because, and I mean, at that point, we had, uh, we lived in this cottage two rooms downstairs um, and then three bedrooms and then a bedroom in the roof all tiny right and bill had plastic bags under his desk um, there were shelves where you couldn't put a shelf that had stock on you know it was just like the tardis uh, and it did get challenging i have to say um, but someone suggested to me that we spoke to what was then called the Adult Opportunity Centre, okay. which was um, an organisation which was based in Sirencester, where adults with learning difficulties, so post-16 right. adults, um, sometimes Downs people, yeah. um, all sorts of varieties of individuals. And they did do some piecework. Right. Uh, and um, the, the manager was a lovely man and he said, you know, we will, the, the, um, the staff here will do this job for you and we will price it for you based on us doing it. Mm -hmm. And then however long it takes our guests to do it, you'll still be paying them the same. You know, mm -hmm. he was very strict about how the organisation was going to work. And they made my mini kits for me. Right. So I took in boxes of fabric and thread and James used to come with me and he'd disappear into the soft playroom <laughs> okay. and he'd be on these b bouncy things with adults, you know, sometimes getting squashed because yeah. they all thought he was such fun <laughs> and it was a bit scary, but that worked really well. You know, mm. we take work in, we're going to have lunch 
and then um, we'd come home with the kids and, and, and pay, our, pay our bills. So that was how, that was the first time I had help with the business other than Bill mm. contributing, you know. So it's kind of what, I don't know, I just feel like this is a great story. I just sit and listen to you tell the whole story, to be honest. So what happened next would be my next question. <laughs> What happened next? I suppose what happened next was um, my accountant, who'd been a friend for years and took over when my other accountant decided to move, took over looking at it all for me. And he's not a, a man who you deliver the accounts to once a year. He's very interested in what goes on. And mm-hmm. um, we've, we've been friends for over 30 years. I mean, we fight uh, a lot, actually. And we have had the occasional three month silence. Okay. Um, but 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 he's an, an amazing bloke. And he said, This this business is going to die if you right. continue like this. Because you cannot design everything, pack everything, deliver everything. It's just going to contract. Mm. So you need to find a way of getting out there a bit more. So then we took on agents. We took on an agent who was recommended to me, who was a lovely bloke. And he looked after London and the South East, really. So he would take orders and send them to me on a, I suppose he went home on a Friday night and stuffed them in an envelope. Right. Obviously, remember, no internet. Mm-hmm. And then we'd make them up and send them out. Um, and gradually that, you know, that extended us. And then... Um, I remember we had a whoopsie daisy baby. Um, I mean, I didn't even realise I was pregnant until well on. And uh, so there was going to be a six year gap between the the kids. And um, while I was in hospital delivering, not actually the delivery, (laughs) because Bill was there for that. Okay. Very soon afterwards, um, one of our designs was mentioned on This Morning. All right. By, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy. I can see his face as clear as anything. And it was the idea of doing a sampler for a family. Mm-hmm. So it was two adults and two children and a house and two trees, you know, very simple, on, on Ada. Yeah. And they showed it. And you could find out how to get it. Well, you can only imagine, can't mm. you? Deadly. Bill was just swamped while I was in hospital. And again, this is people, what, phoning through orders? Phoning through posting. and saying, we saw you on the telly and... And uh, Bill's, Bill's, you know, I can remember I was on design number seven, which happened to be the parish church in Sirencester, um, co- almost coincidentally, really. And um, he said, there must be something I could do to help. And I remember thinking, as we look back, uh, that was probably a very important moment, because if you run a business like we did, and if he wasn't on my side, either the business or the marriage would have failed. Yeah. Because he would put up with the late meals, um, the panic, something's occurred at 10 to 6, and you've got to do something about, you know, all the things that crop up. Um, And you've got kids to get to bed. But, you know, my children maintain that they learnt to cook because they would have starved if they hadn't. (laughs) You know, Lulu will tell you about the neglect, uh, often. She still smiles, Um, though. (laughs) She does still smile. The only time she broke anything, I wasn't there. Okay. So my GP said, you won't be done for beating them, just being absent. <laughs> yeah, right, nice. So, so um, the business was, was, was bursting at the seams, really. And um, we needed uh, premises, and that was a big jump. Mm. Prior to that, I would got someone to help me. So the biggest jump was probably employing somebody. Yeah. Part time, four mornings a week. Can I just can I just touch on that because it's something that's quite interesting to me. Is I'm kind of solopreneuring, although I've got yeah. like various volunteers and stuff like that. But there's this fear, isn't there, that you know you want to expand and and pay for somebody else, and you don't necessarily know there's somebody on call. I mean, your business may have very well been thriving. It might have been a bit of a no brainer, but for me, for instance. I could really do with having someone to assist me almost all the time. I don't know if I can afford that, but in my head, I also know that if they're doing the stuff that's taking my day to day, my chances of like strategizing, is that kind of how it works? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, I, it was with grave misgivings and, and, um, and we were friends too. So there was risk. 
Mm. Um, we were pretty straightforward with each other. And um, I mean, it didn't end well, I'll be honest, but it ended a long time later, shall we say that? Yeah. And um, this person came to work for me um, and, and she was learning the job because she, she was a, you know, a secretary, she'd been a secretary, so she could type. Um, but other than that, you know, she wasn't a stitcher. Mm. And she came in, I mean, she, my office then was um, the middle bedroom. I had the pantry door resting on two bookcases okay. to get yeah. the height yeah. and a big flat surface. Um, so that was how um, the kits were made on the pantry door. And then shelving, there was no Ikea or anything of similar mm. ilk. Um, even I can't you. even remember now where we got some shelving units but but you know it was thinking back we had to we did have to sometimes reinvent the wheel you know because it, no one had done it yet whatever we were trying to do and um, and certainly making the kits up you know I was cutting up skeins of thread well you know, it was ridiculous I needed yeah. to buy them on bobbins sure all those. Anyway, um, so the decision was to take on this lady who I paid weekly by check mm -hmm. and she was under the, you know, it was perfectly acceptable. It was under the, um, whatever the limit was at the time for earnings. Right. Um, so she did enough just to get to that ceiling. Um, and um, what happened was I now had all day, every day to design. Right. So I'm now tucked in a corner with a drawing board on, on legs and I could just get in my bottom in and I'm in and there's a shelf there with my pens on. And we got so busy, Michelle had to have help. Right. You, you yeah, know, yeah, so that yeah. is how it expanded. Mm. Um, and then premises was, was a, there was a few rocky moments there. We, we moved into a ewe milking pen with its ewe milking equipment Lovely. Um, briefly and it was so cold that the paper would bend and the books were curly and, and it would be a disaster and then we moved it above the flower shop in the next village and I couldn't have a desk there there wasn't room so I had to go in at night um, and then we got the premises that we'd always wanted which right. was a, a wheelwright's hut um, I, if I stood on a chair in our on our in our bedroom on Sweetie, mm -hmm. uh, I could see the roof of this building. Oh, so yeah. it was round the corner. Yeah. I drove often because I had stuff, <laughs> but you could walk, you know. Mm. And we had a thousand square feet on one floor, ground floor, mm -hmm. um, and uh, wonderful landlord, spit and a handshake. Right. We won't bother with sisters, they'll just get all the money. We knew mm -hmm. him forever. He was a, a very good man, as are all the family. And he um, had us in, we had a carpet. It must be the sort of carpet they put down at shows. You probably can measure it and it's that thick. Right. So we put that throughout, yeah. dark green, because it was 12 and sixpence or something. And then the adult, well, before that, all my team from the Adult Opportunity Centre came with buckets of emulsion. <laughs> Excellent. I had about 20 of them with paintbrushes. And the walls were painted white right. in this building, as was the floor, of course. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it didn't matter. Then we put this big green carpet down. And then we were given some tables, um, a furniture, an office furniture manufacturing place, were getting rid of worktops and they were probably two inches thick. Right. And it took two people to lift them. Okay. So we got a carpenter to put legs on mm -hmm. and made them high. And then, so we were in there for years. Um, that's where the business was at its bit, but the highest turnover period. I won't mm -hmm. say the highest money made, but highest turnover would have been there. And sometimes there'd be four girls working there. Right. And we're still yeah, talking like always. direct business, you know, people. It was, it was to the shops. Yeah, yeah. Tiny bit of mail order, very small amount. Um, there was a lot of resistance from the retail trade to people selling direct. 
Mm. I can tell you a little story. I was at the, uh, what was called Stitches. Yeah. Now I think it's Craft Hobby and Stitch. Mm-hmm. So it's the trade fair in February. Yeah. That ICHF run. And I was there pregnant with Lulu. Right. So with Bump. And Marilyn Schroeder came on the stand. She was the John Lewis buyer. Mm-hmm. And she came on and said, hello, my dear, you're looking very well. I said, well, thank you, Marilyn, lovely to see you. Oh, Bill, well done, man, well done. You know, <laughs> ho, ho, ho. <laughs> and then she said, um, tell me, dear, are you um, selling direct to the public? And I said, well, no, you know, I don't. I, I said, if someone rings me up, I'll sell them one. Why? Well, there's this knitting and stitching show business going on. And there's going to be quite a few people disappointed here today because they're closing their accounts. Yeah. Because they're dealing direct with the public. Oh, wow. And I stood there with my, I mean, jaw dropped. And mm. she was going to tell. And this was partly about the uh, never knowingly undersold. Oh, okay. Which they, you know, was very important to the John yeah. Lewis group. And if everybody in the in the industry was having ten percent off on the last day of the show, mm, yeah. Anyway, mm-hmm. she she was basically telling people. Now that's many. Well, I tell you how long ago it's thirty two years ago because I was pregnant with Lindy. Yeah. So you didn't generally do both, right? Didn't generally do both. Um, the start of the show was knitting and stitching. Obviously, made a difference. Mm-hmm. but it's taken a long time but then of course the internet happened do you think with the shows was that like the first opportunity that a lot of your customers got to engage with you directly because i guess they've been buying from oh, the definitely. shops and then i mean was that that must have been quite because if you're if you're designing and you're selling to the businesses and you've got your office and stuff you don't really know your audience it must have been no, quite you don't interesting know your audience to, at all. or your impact you perhaps as no, well you don't know your audience and on the occasions that I would go and visit a shop for any reason and perhaps be there as a social thing, later book signings, obviously, but, mm. but going to a shop and taking a little class or demonstrating, I would be sick with fear. Yeah. Quite sick with fear. Because A, I'd be standing amongst all the competition, which mm. is obviously far superior to anything I'd done. And also, I would be exposing myself mm. to the... To the to the people, and and that was something I found very very stressful when I did the craft hobby and stitch. Yeah. For the first few years, I didn't have a stand. I would have part of a stand where a group of the agents would get a space and they would show their portfolios. Yeah. So I'd have say two panels, mm-hmm. and I'd do the Sunday because I'd got a child at home, you know. Mm. Um, I remember when we decided to do the show properly and my my first agent came and said, I want you, if you're going to do your sh- the, the, the fair, I'm going to take you on a walk first. So we just walked around the show and I walked past a stand and looked back. They said, okay, why did you do that? I said, I don't know. Do what? He said, why did you walk past and then look back? And he just, I just said, well, she's looking so cross. And the stand holder was leaning on the wall, mm. looking grumpy. Mm. So he said, so you never, ever look across. Yeah. So our first stand had a coffee table, a table on it and chairs. Mm-hmm. And we would find ourselves at the end of the day saying to our customers, please, will you go home now? <laughs> yeah. It's still a bit um, like that now, I think. I see you sitting yes. in your stand. You're still yes. there. With the, uh... It's still there. So, so um, we learned then to make the stand a very hospitable place mm. and make it somewhere people say, I'll meet you at Jane Greenoff's. Mm-hmm. Because while they're meeting someone, they're looking and thinking, did I order that one? Mm. Oh, we'll put two of those on. Yeah. Because you get them back. So, yes. So, But I found you, that business. You, sorry, I was going to say, I mean, were you like, how did you feel when you started meeting your fans and stuff? I mean, that must have been quite... Well, fans a... are lovely. Fans are lovely. Shopkeepers aren't. Okay. Not always, anyway. Right. I mean, you stand there, you've spent all winter getting ready for a show mm. to show your new things. 
and you're standing there and you've made it look pretty and you've got lilies on the table and biscuits or sweets you've even got a nice carpet so they don't get tired feet and they come on and say this is all a bit dreary and it's your things yeah if you're working for shall we say um coats or dmc or anyone else and you're in your suit i'm generalizing mm -hmm. blokes in suits they're there they're on expenses it makes no difference to them whatsoever whether they sell anything or not mm. they're salaried they didn't design them so they're standing there looking forward to a pint and it's okay i'm mm. standing there gradually shrinking inside because again because i guess you're not you're not getting feedback from your customer base no, at all, not, are you? not there no yeah. and in fact what happens is oh i think these are lovely but my ladies won't do that they're on linen now the times that to give you the reverse of that um i decided one day not pretending to nothing at all that i would design a band sampler as was done in the 16th 17th centuries and I, I would put on it exactly what i chose and i would do it on linen and i didn't care whether it sold or not mm -hmm. it was absolutely and i did and it and bill said well i'm not going to go to sell that in the shops i said i don't actually care <laughs> anyway I took it to the show sold 11 on the first morning nice to the customers Excellent. who actually buy the embroidery yeah and that's the business of the shows and obviously, as we're talking now, the whole show thing is a different conversation because, because not only have we not had any, people will have discovered whether they need them or not. Mm. Yeah. And or whether they need to spend that much money on doing them or not. Yeah. I mean, I think the shows are crucial to the industry because people like me, I mean, I don't have an ivory tower now. I have a cupboard, and you can see this is the it's size. Made of ivory. If I stand up, I it's an ivory cupboard. <laughs> it's, an, it's, yeah, it's an ivory cupboard. <laughs> um, but if I didn't get out to see the shows and see the fabrics out there and the threads available, then things would just deteriorate even more, wouldn't it? Really, yeah. I think. But it's, so, it's going to be difficult for everybody to get back at it. It's, it's quite an unusual one, isn't it? Because like you say, there's there's trade shows and then there's like business to customer shows, like the knitting and stitching shows. Yeah, knitting and, and stitching. And the, I mean, that is a, a marvellous fair. Mm. I mean, I've always thought so. I mean, I had run-ins in the early days with a couple of the people who used to run it. But, well, it was when they advertised my presence when I'd never in intended to go. Right. When I got letters from people saying, I brought my books up and you weren't even there. Mm. Well, I hadn't no one had asked me yeah you know and then they had to be told i wasn't mm. having it um but when you know when we've done the shows for the last 20 odd years i mean the physical act of getting the stuff up and in and out i mean the stand the guild stand always looks lovely yeah and people say they come and say you know they walk in and smile and and uh, they they come back year on year on year and that takes seven hours mm. five to seven hours to get it to look like that and you're already knackered when you get there you yeah know. yeah but you I'm forget allowed that, to say you? knackered of course you, yeah, you've already talked about drugs and sworn on here so it's fine <laughs> oh blimey yeah. anyway so there we are so so yeah the shows it's it, it was always very interesting it's scary too because you you hope your things are going to be popular and and I've never yet put something out that I haven't been pleased with. Mm -hmm. I might not have been as pleased as I thought I was going to be when I saw it in my head. But uh, if I haven't liked it enough, it hasn't gone out, you know. So it would be very disappointing if something, people disliked things. Mm. And then I find with the shows as well, like... I mean, the knitting and stitching show particularly is a good one because you get inspiration. You've got textile yes. art galleries and things yes. like that. Absolutely. So when you do the shows, it's a little bit like the tennis circuit in a way. You you get to know the community, don't you? You see the yes. same people and stuff like that. And I find that to be very rewarding. It's because ever you so rewarding. Sense of where you are now. Yes, absolutely. What was that like when you know when you started doing the shows? Because presumably, is that the first time that you got to meet your peers, as it were? You know, fellow yes. designers. Yes, I mean, meeting other designers, um, 
there were odd occasions when we did get to see each other, but not very much. No, and I mean, touch wood, you know, I've always got on ever so well with everybody, as far as I know. I mean, I don't know how much they loathe me, but, you know. They're too I've afraid got some to good... loathe you, I think that's the truth. Hmm? They're too afraid to loathe oh, you. Oh, good, good, <laughs> excellent. Um, and, um, yes, I mean, it's... It, and I've always wanted to be helpful. Um, you know, when you see... I, I won't mention examples, but I've certainly seen people struggling on a stand. Um, and I've thought to myself, well, is it up to me to say something or not? Mm. And then when you say, if you sell everything on this stand, will you have paid for the stand? No. Yeah. Well, come on, get a grip. Um, and, and those walls have cost you £180 a square metre. Yeah. Why can I see so much of the wall? Mm. You know, let's, let's make it look really pretty get the stuff up there and then, you know whatever whatever anyway and it's it's been very gratifying over the last since i no longer the cross stitch guild boss mm -hmm. um to go to shows and people to come up and say come and see it now see what you think mm. and yeah. think yeah it's smashing well done mm. yeah and isn't it doing well yeah of course it is <laughs> yeah so that's lovely when mm. you see people having success with it when did the Cross Stitch Guild officially start? Well, it officially started on the 16th of March, 1996, at two o'clock. Okay, at two o'clock. But, but, it actually started when I was at the Knitting and Stitching Show, uh, the autumn one, which I'm guessing was the only one then, yeah. thinking back. Was that and still at Alley Valley? Ali Pally, yeah, okay. absolutely. So I was there, you know, we were doing the usual thing, and a lady came onto the stand, visibly upset, teary. And I said, Oh my lord, what's the matter? Can I get you a glass of water or something? She said, I said, Come on, what's the matter? And she said, I've just been to so and so, and they told me my cross stitch wasn't an embroidery. Yeah. And I could have ripped someone's head off. Yeah. I just said, what do you mean it's not embroidery? Mm. Um, and she said, and I'm just ever so upset because I was so pleased with it. And I said, mm. it's lovely. I'm incandescent. God, you can embroider a story. Of course it's embroidery. Mm. Did they not know what it means? The dictionary says about what embroidery is. And I was incandescent, actually. Mm. I just thought, what a mean thing to do. <laughs> Anyway, that was that. And I came home and rang my accountant, Neil, and said, I'm going to start a guild. Oh, God, now what? I am. I'm going to, how do I start a guild? What do I need to do? He said, I don't know. I'll find out. And um, that was how it started. Mm. And it was for anybody who loves to stitch, but counted. Right. So I'm asked, you know, do you have any printed on? And I said, I'm sorry, no, we don't. There are some. I'm sure there'll be some at the show somewhere. They're not my thing. I don't think they're accurate enough for me to be satisfied with the finished result. Mm. Whereas if you learn to count, you will find something really pretty. And often I've been able to show them on something little, you know. Mm. And they've sat there and done a leaf and gone, oh. You know, um, so, um, so it was anything that was counted. And it's funny because I was writing this story for um, Jenny Dixon, who you know. Mm -hmm. And Jenny's my editor on our, our website, our new website. And I was writing some jottings and she insists on checking them for swearing, <laughs> yeah. misuse of text, etc. <laughs> and um, and she, um, I said, I said I, what I actually said was, I was so cross, I said to the lady, I'm going to start a guild for people who count. And, I, and we both laughed since. <laughs> and it was actually Neil, my beastly accountant, who came up with our motto, which is Together We Count. Yeah, nice. That's very good. That's because, a very good uh, yes, it's nice. Because mm. Fabric Flare, do you remember Fabric Flare? Yeah. They did lots of the coloured um, even weaves in boxes. Right. So you could buy you could buy nine coloured bits of fabric without having to go to the roll, mm -hmm. and so people were buying more fabrics to look at. Mm. Um, 
and they had you can count on us nice which yeah. i thought was lovely yeah uh, but they'd got it yes so <laughs> the pe pe so the guild was started for people who count and so so not just cross stitch then no. black work hardanger yes. Yes. I, I want to say Mount Melick, but that's my own ignor ignorance. It's my ignorance too. Yeah, I'll have I to don't Google know that. What that is. Let's I'm not say Mount Melick because you would it's go, not, yes, that's right. It's not something I do. But then, so did that then, because, I mean, were you prior to that, were you just like mostly cross stitch and obviously black work, uh, sorry, back stitch, Anything. that sort of thing going along with it? or? Well, I did do Hardanger, uh, Hardanger kits and a few black work kits. But we did county cross stitch and close associations, I suppose. Hmm. And do you? And then I was going to say, answer. over time, have you? Because we've got this whole historical context, yes. and the stuff that you're doing is very much aligned to a recognition of that fact, isn't it? And sort of honouring yes. that and maintaining that and stuff. So, was there a point where suddenly this like historical significance came upon you, and you started to realise the story that you're now a part of? I don't really know if there was a moment. I, I love samplers and I collect them. I, I say I collect them. That when we lived at Inglestone, I could afford to collect them. Mm -hmm. When we bought Pink's Barn, it was the proverbial money pit. Um, mm -hmm. and, and one doesn't have the same disposable. Um, I still look uh, to buy samplers, to buy a variety. Mm -hmm. And that's what my drawing room is full of. Mm -hmm. um, and I love to read about the children who did them. Um, so whether, and the, his, the historical patterns and things I do like. Um, having said that, one of the best selling things I've done for the Cross Stitch Guild in the last year was a flowery chicken. <laughs> so, you know, I have branched out <laughs> a bit. Well, that was, yeah. that was again, it's, it, things happen because of stories with me. Mm. It's interesting, my father was a storyteller. Right. I mean, he was a beast, actually, not a, not a particularly nice person, but a very good storyteller. And my son did storytelling at uni, at okay. Dartington, effectively. Yeah. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? So, so often something I do starts with a story. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, um, the idea of Jane Eyre and working on a slate in, in, the, in the orphanage hospital, you know, strongly appeals that was the book to end all books as far as I'm concerned and um, and then things like the children at the Bristol orphanages working those red samplers it fascinates me just mm -hmm. the idea of it having said that I love to draw flowers and and obviously houses um, I suppose I have an antique colorway yeah. you know my palette which is still the guild palette really mm. is is 200 colors from the range but they are, they are all, you could use any of them on any design and they would go together. They're so also that's in sort a, of antique -y. Yeah, and they're also in a sort of a hue, like there's a naturalness. I think the colours you choose are ones that could have been produced using natural, you know, Yes, I'd like the idea that they could be. Yeah. You know, even though they probably aren't. But no, yes, I'd, I'd love to do stuff with that. I mean, that's sort of what I'm thinking about... Um, my later ventures really is that because I can make 10 of something, mm. I like the idea that I can make 10 of something. So I could do something using some hand dyed threads mm. that mm. I wouldn't be able to repeat because I don't have to anymore. Exclusive limited edition as well. You put it's a 500% it, 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 markup on those. You, well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing because we've done, we have done some things where when they're gone, they're gone. Mm. Um, because I'm not, um, I was trying to explain this this morning, um, you know, when, when we had the cross stitch guild, I was always wanting to try different fibres, different threads, different fabrics, hand dyed fabrics, um, all these things. But if you're doing something that needs to be repeated, mm. you have to continue to be able to get it. Yeah. And let's face it, artists who are hand painting threads for specialist use don't want an order for five hundred of them. Yeah, sure. They don't. Yeah. Mm. So it's a, it's a, you know, the easiest thing to do as a kit producer is use one of the two main varieties of threads and fourteen cow data. Yeah. Because you know you can get it. Mm. Um, 
and that, there's nothing actually wrong with that, but it but it does limit your um, the skills a bit. Perhaps. Weirdly, it's almost like there's a difference there between the design of cross stitch design and the art of cross stitch design. Mm. So mm. you know, if you're taking a more artistic bent, you're like, here's a limited edition. No two yeah. products will be the same. That sort of approach, isn't it? But obviously, it's a very narrow audience it's a tiny little audience mm. and it's not an audience where shopkeepers are going to play no yeah, no but that's that fine but that's where your core audience that yeah. gets your newsletters and all those sorts of things yeah there, yeah. Yes. yeah do you think that i mean how is your or how have your design skills evolved over the years what have you learned about design and what have you learned about cross stitch design you know in general mm. well i don't know the answer to this it's a hard one isn't it I don't know where all this comes from. Mm -hmm. I genuinely, you know, I'm driving to San Ancestor to get some groceries and into my head pops the word spice collection. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking around to see who said it. Um, so of, often it's, it, so as far as where it all comes from, the other thing is that, I mean, I, if I have a skill, it's putting colors together. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't draw for toffee. If it's a squared paper, I can draw on it. If it's plain paper, I can't. Uh, you work that out because I don't know what the No, no, no. Is. I can, I can, because it's the same uh, as embroidery versus cross stitch. You know, some people yes. are excellent in the rigidity of the pixelated yes. form. Yes. I like that. Mm -hmm. Excellent in the. But write that down. That's a nice one. <laughs> yes, the business of um, free embroidery. I'm, I'm not good. I'm not a good embroiderer. Mm. And um, I, I have proved it to myself on two recent occasions where I have bought something from a designer. There's one particular thing. There's a lovely lady whose name will come to me in a second. Adin Christie. Have okay. you met Mrs. Adin Christie? I'm not sure. Okay, mm. uh, she has done a wren, a three-dimensional, lifelike wren. Okay, stump work. It is a wren size. Oh, okay. And it is in a glass dome. Right. And it is to die for. It's embroidered, and there's a little form that the, the embroidery goes on that's wren-shaped with the tail. Right. And it gets £180. Right. Uh, I've seen... Hers, I've seen two made by other embroiderers, and I bought the kit. Uh -huh. Now, I have been back to her four or five times for the first piece that you do, yeah. because I'm not satisfied with it, right? and had to buy the materials again to right. make the wing, yeah. or whatever it was, because I can't do free embroidery. Mm. I struggle. Mm. I will do it. Um, but it's proving challenging. Now, if it's counted, it's it's in my... If you cut me down the middle, mm. I'm counted. I've heard that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'd, The thing that changed everything for me, of course, was the cross-stitch programme. That was what I was going to ask about your design process, because obviously back in the day, it's graph papers, like you say, Tipex. Graph paper and rotating pens. Yeah, amazing. And I drew in crosses, Vs, Ls and Xs. Right. And, and I could see the colours in my head. I'd have the threads out and I'd give them a number. And I still, to this day, don't know how that worked. And I was only once, because then, sort of recapping, I accidentally got people who wanted to stitch for me. Yeah. You know, I'd meet them and they'd say, oh, I'll stitch for you. I'd say, no, 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 no. You don't really realise what you're going to, you know, you're going to get, you're not going to get a picture. You're just going to get the chart. <laughs> and a bit of a um, headache. And I'd pay you a pittance. Yeah. You know, oh, no, 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 I'd love to do it. And some of them have been with me 25 years. Yeah. Um, and I would send them out these drawings. And on one occasion, we opened a piece of stitching when it came back in the post. And everyone in the family went, yep. <laughs> And I had you introduced two new colours, right? Two new colours to the palette, and it was wrong. Mm. They went in the bin. Went in the bin. So I've always been able to picture what they look like finished, and be more or less right. Mm -hmm. um, but getting the cross stitch program, someone said to me, "Now you've got all this spare time because you've got the cross stitch program. What are you doing?" 
Well, I mean, what you're doing is, is you know, when I, when I drew my first two books, I would know if I drew a kite. I had to draw it however many times it was going to go round the design. I had to do a mirror image mm-hmm. down the other side so the border would be complete and I'd be drawing it by hand. Yeah. Obviously, when I had the cross-stitch programme, mm-hmm. I could spend all morning detailing the kite and I could use cut and paste. Yeah. That's what changed for me mm-hmm. because I could spend hours on getting a bunch of grapes how I wanted them with as many colours in it as I wanted. But I didn't have to trace it on the double glazing to get the other side right, which is and, certainly how I used to do it. Okay. And do you design just straight into the software now, or do you still sketch out on paper first? I still, I, I print myself out squared paper. Mm-hmm. So I've got on, the, on, the, on my programme, I've got um, various templates, um, a page in the Cross Stitch Guild magazine, and a double page spread, and so on. Mm-hmm. Because then if I, if I want to say to Jenny, this chart's going to use six pages, it obviously has to use six pages. I can't make it use seven. Yeah. So it means I stay within the framework size-wise. Mm-hmm. So I'll print out something that is that size. I'll draw a pencil, mm-hmm. at least some of it. Yeah. And then I square it off with a pen to get the outline where I want it. And then I transfer the outline to the computer. And, and all the colouring is done on the computer. Yeah. And I mean, do you, do you still need like the physical thread reference? Do you still have the threads there to see the colours? Or are you that like, there you go. I've got one of them floating around somewhere as well. Yeah. And, and mine's highlighted, which are the ones that are in the Guild mm-hmm. template. Yeah. Just so that, I mean, you know, when you, it doesn't matter. Of course I can use another colour if I want to. And in the days when I had the rack here with them all on, mm. uh, I would suddenly say to myself, actually, I am going to use a new colour, so I did. And I'd go back there and I'd pick the threads I wanted and they'd be the ones that were in here all the time. <laughs> right, they wouldn't yeah. be new at all. Yeah. They'd be exactly the same. So, um, but when you're, when you're doing industrial quantities of things, um, those little bobbins all cost X. Mm. And if you're going to pull the threads in one go, you're going to need five of them. Mm-hmm. So it's not fair on Andrea to introduce a new colour for yeah. one, the eye on the tiger. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? You've got to be sensible about it. Mm. I've got yeah. a project that I'm going to tell you about in a minute if we've time. Yeah, we've got all the time in the world. Well, this won't ever be available for anybody. It's for me. Mm-hmm. And what this is, I should have thought of it, and perhaps I'll get it, and you can have it in the preamble, I'll show it to you. Um, have you heard of a firm called Thistle Threads in America? I'm going to say no, to be on the safe side. Okay, well, have a, have a little mooch mm. at some point on the internet. Um, she has a very mixed response from folk, right. this lady. Um, but she had designed and made casket um, blanks and by caskets I mean the type of embroidered box that would stand so high with a sloping top right have doors and drawers right and I've seen one for 80,000 pounds in a glass case right for sale the original uh, Elizabethan decorated boxes are fantastic money and they are fantastic things. So they were decorated with three-dimensional embroidery, often stunt work, right. so the people would have little wooden arms and legs and wigs. Mm-hmm. Not what I like. Anyway, this company um, had the boxes made. Right. Blanks in, in a wood without any knots in it. I might be Douglas fir, but I can't remember. And the drawers come out, and there are secret drawers. Okay. Lots of them. Yeah. So you go in behind and press the button and another drawer comes out and it's, it's like a Chinese puzzle. Mm-hmm. And getting it back together is certainly a Chinese puzzle. <laughs> um, so these would be decorated and then the insides of the drawers would be lined with silk or with marble paper. And they're, they're very collectible. Anyway, I always check 
antique stroke junk shops thoroughly in case they don't realize they've got a stunt work box okay. anywhere. Right. Because sometimes they're in another box, so I'm always in there appearing. <laughs> um, so the second half of the story is that we had a guild member who, sadly, we lost, I'm going to say, 18 months ago now, um, after a long illness. And she had one of these boxes that she bought from America. She was planning to decorate because you could buy the box. You could enter the course, uh, which didn't give you designs, but it gave you inspirational material. Mm -hmm. So you would come up with a design to go on your box. So you've got all the sides, the slopes, the top, inside the lid, inside the doors. Um, anyway, Jane left me the box. No. The, cart, the, 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 mm. the, the blank, for want of another description. And I have been thinking about it mm -hmm. for about five or six months now. Um, and I think I'm going to start it after Christmas. Are you, Where are, do you know what the design's going to be? It just occurs to me that being a second generation storyteller, is this box not going to be some kind of memoir? It could be. A memoir I armoire? I don't, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to have to, I will be photographing it and it will go in jottings and, and, and blogs mm. for, just because it might as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping it'll look pretty. But it's about designing something for which I do not have to write instructions. Amazing. Will be the first time mm. in 35 years that I've yeah. ever done it. Because I was going to ask uh, you, do you have any other artistic pursuits or creative things that aren't related to your business that you enjoy? Um, we won't talk about red wine. That is a creative pursuit, but... <laughs> No, we don't really class. No, okay, we won't class that. Um, I'm loving my garden. I have time to do it. Right. By that I mean I've I've changed it, uh, and will change it again this spring. And I have cutting garden, so I grow flowers for the house. Mm -hmm. So it's a very specific area of planting, mm -hmm. um, and I've really enjoyed it. So when the guild changed hands, mm -hmm. I bought a very large, well, it feels large, I bought a great big greenhouse, mm -hmm. which is now plonked in the middle of what was the lawn. Uh, and I'm out there messing about. I've got heating and lighting in it. And so and I can be out the there. the radio. I um, have the radio. Yeah. Sometimes, I don't, don't often use the radio. Sometimes it's nice not to have anything. Yeah. Just be pricking out seeds. Do you think that's a nice balance because the rest of your creativity is rather indoors? Do you think yes. that's part of it? Yeah. It's probably very good for me because I, yeah, if, if I didn't have a dog, mm. I could stay in all the time mm. because I would scuttle upstairs to my space. Uh, we have got the slight, um, I'm not going to call it conflict because we don't conflict about it. But Bill thought I'd retired too. And I obviously haven't. Yeah, I thought that because I, I remember when you said, you know, that the guild's mm. taken on a new ownership. It was like, oh, you'd be able to take your foot off the gas. Seemingly not, President Emeritus. And, you know, you've launched a new it, enterprise it, and everything. I know. It, I, it was very exciting. And I was thrilled that it had happened. And it was right, absolutely right, that Andrew took over. He, he couldn't have been a, a better person. Mm. Couldn't have been a better person to do it. Um, and, and, and I know she's exhausted, but loves it, which is just how I was. Yeah. Um, so that's great. But I can remember coming back from the first real meeting where we had legal people and accountants and, you know, all the going on, crying my eyes out. Right. Going upstairs and crying my eyes out. But so what's the matter? I said, I'm going to have to watch bloody television. <laughs> I cannot bear it. <laughs> I'm going to go mad. Yeah. Um, and he said, no, it's not compulsory. I said, but it will be, won't it? <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to sit in the kitchen. I mean, he doesn't watch much either, but you know what I mean? I just couldn't imagine yeah. the gap in my life was going to be so enormous. Mm. Um and then, of course, I was I was on the team, consultancy team, for for two years anyway. Mm -hmm. And then Andrea has discovered that she's really good at running the guild. 
and, and doing the, the, the irregular newsletters out to the members and and um, just the whole stock control is something I never understood and she does mm -hmm. um, I mean she's doing an absolutely cracking job um, but she's not designing right she has and yeah. can yeah but you know the, the hours in the day mm. you know I used to feel late at half past nine in the morning and that's quite stressful mm. when I had my magazine with future that was the problem yeah because I was always late Mm -hmm. You know, when I went, I was late when I got to bed. I was late when I got up. I was never going to catch up, um, and and that was in the end why it had to be something that I curtailed. We did forty issues, and I was well chuffed with that, but it just couldn't continue. Was that like the prime time? Would you say that was like your the prime of not Miss Jean Brodie, but do you know what I mean when you were like? Well, I was probably better known then, yeah. but I don't know that it was the prime time. I don't know, I don't know, you know, there have been different prime times. Yeah. There have been, getting a book published was so exciting. Mm, yeah. Um, looking back, it wasn't very good. But looking, you know, obviously one learns as you go along. The first time you hold you. your own book, isn't it? Like, I remember the first time I yes, held my own book you and do. you're just like... Of course, yeah, it is. Uh, it, this, uh, what is it about it? I don't know what it is about it. When I wrote my blog for the, um, for the new site, um, I wrote my father found me a continuous disappointment. Firstly, because mm. I was a girl. Right. He wanted a boy. And at least he wanted a clever girl. Hmm. Um, now, it's very interesting that, that um, if we look back over that period, um, you know, the school I went to, uh, getting kicked off art and embroidery classes, um, not being able to do sums, all these things are fascinating now hmm. in, in how, you know, I came to what I did yeah. later. You know, when I talked to Lou and to my to son about, you know, careers now aren't necessary. I mean, Bill joined the bank expecting to stay there till he retired. Hmm. I expected to be a nurse till I retired. Yeah. Because you did then. Yeah. Doesn't happen like uh, that. And now that isn't, yeah. as you know, we all know, Bill's had three occupations you know he was on the road for me for years visiting mm. the shops and 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 uh, looking helping with the business and then he worked for our accountant for 13 years which was supposed to be for six weeks and then he scuttled off for, for years but you know life is very different isn't it now mm. um, yeah so I don't know which was the prime time you know get, getting into writing the books was lovely um, the magazine was fun um, doing shopping channel telly is lovely, makes mm -hmm. me laugh. You still do that? Yeah, I'm working for Sewing Street. Yeah. Um, they, the Sewing Quarter were doing very well, but mm. Immediate Media um, closed on Christmas they? last year. Do you know what? That was well, very disappointing. People were very sad. I was about three weeks away from going on it for the first time when they pulled the plug as well. I was like, oh. <laughs> Well, you know, you need to talk to the guys at Sewing Street. The Sewing Street's lovely because they've they've it's 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 definitely got legs. Um, right. We we were managing. I mean, I was there within the first week, uh, borrowing a studio from the Jewelry Quarter. Right. Who are the well, the man who owns Jewelry Quarter is the owner of the whole thing, and he's a very interesting fellow. And he, we were using the studio that they use for making videos. Mm -hmm. So there was room for three people, but only just. <laughs> so social distancing was never going to happen there. Because, you know, it couldn't. Yeah. Um, but now they're in their own studio. Um, and he started Yarn Lane right. as well, which is okay. for knitters and crochet. Mm -hmm. He always maintained that Sewing Street was for sewing and stitching. Yeah. So it's quilting, obviously dressmaking, craft sewing, you're making stuffed toys or whatever. Um, and, and embroidery, cross stitch and embroidery. So it's a narrower brief. Mm. Um, and I do once a month, a couple of hours once a month. Um, I think it's quite which exciting. Is in isn't it? Yeah. Because mm. she's got to make the stuff. You know, mm. it's got to be made, it's got to be in the warehouse before you go on air. Otherwise, you can't use it. Um, and um, I don't want to be there too much. And it's also important that not everything the Guild does is on there. Yeah, you know, there's a balance, isn't there? Mm. How do you feel about the state of the cross stitch sector these days? 
it's changed, I guess. Well, it's changed out of all recognition, hasn't it, to, to when I started. Uh, a number of things can be pointed to. Um, the, the beginning of Hobbycraft stores mm-hmm. um, changed the industry permanently. Um, I'm not criticising and not commenting or giving an opinion. But if you go to buy your threads from your embroidery shop, and while you're there, you're shopping for embroidery things. That is one thing. If you go to your local superstore because they're well, because they're um, cheaper. Yeah. Or um, sorry, I've just lost my earphones. Right. So I'll just get them back in. Yes, if you go, or well, they're two for a pound, or whatever was done, then you're shopping there. Mm. And a lot of it, specialist needlework shops folded as a result of that. And yeah. if the shops aren't there, it's harder to get stuff. Um, That's not an unreasonable uh, thing to point out, though, because you're quite right in as much as you go to a needlework shop, you're talking with a specialist and you'll find a very focused, the ancillary yes. things around it. Hobby you craft might is, buy things. Yeah, hobby yeah. crafts are great in as much as they're easy to find and they've got yes. a lot of the stuff you want. But yeah, there's no depth of range and despite the staff's best endeavours, is not going to be the depth of, like, skill and wisdom for you to pick No, no, no. no. And, and they do do classes. I mean, I've done classes for we got right back at the beginning. Um, but, it, yes, it's, it's, it's a different animal. So there was that, that made a significant difference, I'm sure. And, of course, we, we have to accept that the internet was another big factor. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and one can puff and blow about... Um, there was a very funny advert, uh, cartoon in Bill's Private Eye magazine. And I guess it was one of the superstores that are going, big sign outside, to all the lazy people who bought online. Mm. We're sorry our Christmas window isn't as pretty as usual mm. or something. But um, the other part of the online thing is if you want to learn how to do something, go on YouTube yeah. because it will be there. Mm. Yeah. So, so I, I've had previous customers of mine, no names, no pack drill, yeah. come up to me at an issue and stitching show, isn't it sad about cross-stitch? You must be mortified. And I'm looking at them. Well, you know, it doesn't sell anymore, does it? And I just say, well, it's not in many shops now, but the only thing that's changed is the buying pattern. Yeah. There's absolutely no doubt people are doing cross stitch, and Andrea is proving it over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's arguable that it's stronger than it's been for a long time. I think so. I think yeah. so. I won't have any truck with. And of course, lockdown mm. has had a profound effect on craft generally. Yeah. People have suddenly, you know, they've turned out all the cupboards they can. They can't get to the, the recycling centre because it's shut. They can't get rid of everything. So they're looking at, what am I going to do? And anybody with a limited intelligence can have a go at a craft. You know, you don't have to be, te- you don't have to be very artistic to play with stuff, you yeah. know. It's My daughter strange. once... Go on, sorry. No, go on. My daughter once came to me to say, Mummy, I'm bored. I said, are you darling? That's awful. Bless. Come with me, darling. <laughs> she should have known. Yeah. And she emptied the pantry, yeah. cleaned individual tins, and put them back in alphabetical order. Oh man. It never happens again. <laughs> yeah, I've got to try that. <laughs> but that's the thing I felt it was it was just a weird side effect, but quite a, a rewarding one that people turn to hand making things yes. because it almost hand validated making. the thing that we're trying to say, you know? Yes. Don't just buy stuff, make stuff because the reward is in the process. Absolutely. It's quite interesting because this um, fellow whose name escapes me, and he won't like that, who owns the jewellery and the, 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 the TV channel, um, he came on to Sewing Street right at the beginning and said, if we need to use mindfulness to help our mental state, stitching and other types of embroidery has got to be the way forward. Mm. Long stitching when you just want to sit and relax. And I cannot tell you over the years how many individuals have come to me and said, oh, 
Do you know, when you said when your husband was ill, you sat and stitched with your back to the clock. It was exactly what I did. Mm. When my son had surgery as a youngster, I was sitting in our little room, stitching the front gable of the Liberty Building. Right. While he was under the anaesthetic. Mm. Because that was the only way I could deal with it. Mm. And when Bill was having five hours and 40 minutes surgery, some years later, I was sitting stitching because mm. yeah. it's just it just does so much good for you um i think it's quite are... i think it's quite remarkable i think that's the thing that i'm never i never cease to be amazed by is quite how powerful and cross stitch in particular because you're yes, yes. coming back to center coming back to center coming yes. back to center you know it's yes. overwhelmingly yes. powerful yes and it's it's and and the even now, you know, when, when I, I mean, I've got people who stitch for me, I don't have to stitch at all if I choose not to. Um, but I'm thinking of things all the time. Um, but sometimes, and usually when I've been in a stitching environment, for instance, even when I was up at the television the other day, I leave the house at quarter past four in the morning mm. for my drive. And, you know, the night before I'm thinking, do I need to be doing this? Because I go to bed at nine o'clock. But actually, get in the car, on the journey, once I'm there, in the office, surrounded by fabric and threads, everywhere, it's everywhere. Um, and there's always some good crack going on. And I pick up a book that's going to be featured, and I think, oh, do you know, I could, I could draw a, hmm. And I want to go home and stitch it now. <laughs> it's still as strong as it always was. It's amazing. But it's so good for your head. Uh, and you know if the weather's bad I mean yes of course I love to garden but there's times like today when frankly that would be counterproductive mm. um, we always joke about boxing day in this family I don't know when your program's going to go out you know obviously. I'm tempted I'm tempted to put out Christmas day boxing day I should I should have started my husband and I shouldn't I I was <laughs> going to be out on Christmas day <laughs> no my um but my treat to me on Boxing Day is we have chips with cold meat uh, as food. Mm. And I don't cook other than that. And I always have a new piece of stitching. Nice. Always. I've done mm. for a long, long time. If, it's, if, it, if I've timed it right, I've got a piece of unbleached linen. Mm -hmm. uh, that lovely sort of raw linen. I've got gold-plated needles. I've got my threads organised. I know what I'm going to do. And it's just the best, still the best. I've engineered myself, I think, quite a nice boxing day in that I've bought Flora quite a big Lego thing. So Ooh. she's three and a half and I don't think she can make it. She's going I... to have to make it. Well, well I have to chip. tell you, I, James does the same. <laughs> He's, it, we've seen, he, because he was, his son was sent home from school yesterday because of COVID. Mm. Um, and I mean, he hasn't got COVID. He's got a cough. Um, but I saw the um, the turntable ladder fire engine mm -hmm. that his son has made this morning of three <laughs> rubbish. Yeah. They've sat there together making this yeah. thing. We've got. But we've, they both enjoy it. Yeah, and I do as well. It's been there's, it's been lovely with Flora actually because we both enjoy Lego, and actually she really enjoys stitching. I've got some plastic canvas, and I just yes. get her a bit of thread, and she's quite happy to sit there doing. It. And she's like, you know, she's not stitching anything in particular. No, but I left her for like matter. ten minutes and did some washing up, and she was just there stitching the whole time. And you know, yes. three and a half, I couldn't be happy with that. Yes, it makes me proud. I um, I bought it. Sorry, go on. No, it's just gonna. I was going to ask you, um, what's next? What because you've got the, your new enterprise, your treasure seeking, treasure of, seeking. What's which the, it gives uh, me excuse to shop. Well, yeah. So I wondered what what's on the horizon for you. Well, I'm I'm going to hopefully put together. Um, I'm going to chart up uh, if I can uh, my old my own sampler collection. Um, make the chart them and um, put them out as charts to buy. Okay. For those people who want to do replicas, you know, with, so the, ones with the mistakes. The my own. That you've, yeah, you've the old bought. ones. Historical. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Some are done. Some yeah. are done already. Three or four certainly are done. And, um, and they'll go out to people, you know, the enthusiasts who want to make one with the errors in it, which is a tiny market, but, but is there without a doubt. 
when you when you recreate those when you recreate those pieces of work that must give you a somewhat deeper connection with the work because it's, it's you're lovely. reproducing it yeah it's lovely um if i'd thought about this i'd have been better prepared so i'm sorry about right. that no, no, no. but but i've 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 just used some alphabet letters from Catherine Archer's Bristol sampler when she was at the Muller Orphanage in Bristol in about 1860. And I reproduced some on a, um, a little band around a cotton reel and on a scissor keeper. And I just love the fact that her sampler has been used as a sampler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's been used for what the purpose was. She was showing she could label linen and she could, she knew her alphabet letters, and she could make sure that when she works in care, in, 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 in service, which is probably where she'd go, mm. she would be there marking the linen, and, you know, she, it was her CV. Mm. Yeah. Part and of her still CV. still lives on now, like hundreds still of lives years on. later. Amazing. You, you know, I mentioned YouTube earlier. I've yeah. just got to tell you this. I don't know if you know it already. I went onto YouTube one day, pretending to have it all and there was a picture of me okay which took me aback because i hadn't been on it wasn't you know and i investigated and i am fated i think is the word in the united states in a society who look for material that will accidentally put you to sleep <laughs> i am not okay. joking i am not joking there were three or four hundred people who had commented right. on my YouTube videos. Um, and it's hysterical. <laughs> it's absolutely hysterical. So, uh, and I had had wind of this before because I'd had an email from somebody in America who was writing about people who have insomnia mm -hmm. and writing an article about some people choose certain voices to listen to. And obviously people listen to sleep tapes and all this. Yeah. And I cropped up <laughs> and she said, how did I feel about it? I said, well, I don't really mind, you know, I have to be honest, that wasn't why the video was recorded. <laughs> um, but now I, I've got quite a following. That's amazing. Are you going to do There's any people... of those like breathy videos? You know, they call no. it ASMR, don't they? <laughs> I'm just putting a needle through some thread. No, that's exactly AS. That's what it was. Yeah, brilliant. AS. Yes, and I'm not. No, I've never done it on purpose. I promise. <laughs> but we had to have a chuckle because um, the things like it was when I was wearing my hair spiky, mm. and I got lots of dear rock chick. <laughs> <laughs> And others saying that uh, Lady Diana would have sounded like me if she'd lived longer. <laughs> I mean, it's mostly from across the pond. Yeah, but amazing. it has made me smile. So yes, my fame goes before me. I thought what I'd do uh, by wrapping this up, I wanted to just pick your wisdom. One of the questions I ask in some of these other videos is the kind of the advice that you would give to someone who wanted to start out being a cross-stitch designer or was already getting going. And what like the, the main bits of wisdom you would say, look, just do these things and I just wondered what, what your best cross stitch designer wisdom is. Um, okay. Um, I suppose I suppose the answer I would give if I was approached at a show would be because the magazines are out there and need new material all the time, it would be worth designing lots of things and offering them to the magazines and seeing if you could get known that way. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the internet is out there now so that you can quite simply have a simple website, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, it's um, complicated if you get into the money stuff. But And the other thing is actually getting good pictures of what you've made. Mm -hmm. It was a mistake I made in the early days and not realising how important the picture is to the stitcher. Mm -hmm. Um design what you like i think uh and realistically price your things because right. sadly if you don't you'll be expected to do them at those prices forever what would you say how how does someone realistically price a thing what? i don't know the answer to that really so the answer yeah i do because i do you have to work out what the stuff you did it on cost mm -hmm. and that sometimes it surprises you um in the 
early days were sort of when Bill came into the company full time, he worked out how much a square inch of each fabric was. Right. Just so that I knew. Mm -hmm. And how much our threads are pre-sorted on all the bigger kits. So how much does it cost for somebody to pre-sort the threads? Mm. How much does each length of thread cost? I mean, if, you, if you're realistic, um, a plastic bag with nothing in it costs something. Yeah, right, yeah. So you've got a plastic bag, you've got the charts and instructions, and if you're producing those on the modern colour copiers and things, how much is a click? Because mm -hmm. you don't count those things. How much is the printed cotton card? This is boring. No, 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 and no, this is not. sadly what artistic people don't want to do. Mm. Artistic people actually think, well, I don't mind giving them the card. That's ridiculous. They need the card. But actually, if you pay your printer for the card, yeah. so kept realistically adding up what the thing costs, not your time designing it at this point, and not even the labour making it, just physically looking at what the thing you're going to sell in the bag cost you this much. Mm. And then work out if you, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, generally, I would say that when the needle workshops that I were still speaking, I suppose they doubled and added VAT. Mm. So sometimes you look and think, actually, hang on a minute. I've done all that work. Yeah. But that's realistically, and in the fashion industry, it could be three times plus VAT. And then you find a lot of sellers these days will be just be selling the patterns and maybe they're just selling them digitally. Do you think there's a way to kind of quantify the design time? I think it's really hard. It's something I'm going to have to face with my charts for the antique samplers. Um, you're buying the, um, the design, the time, the fact you can stitch it again whether or not that's legal or not, because that's a very grey area. Right. You know, when you sell something, do you sell it for one use only? Interesting, yeah. Or not? I yeah. don't know. Um, copywriting. Um, I've had a few run-ins there, only seriously once, where a College of Further Education was sending their students to photocopy our kits. Right. Which is wrong. Cool, yeah. Um, and, and the principal wrote to me, when he found out and was extremely apologetic because I mean, it's livelihoods, isn't it? Yeah. The other thing that I used to think sometimes made me wild was not that people do give charts to each other because everybody does it, but they tell me, <laughs> yeah. you know, they say, Oh, I, I put a, a notice up actually, because I wanted to do your long river Thames. I wasn't paying that. And you know, someone sent it to me. <laughs> they expect me to be pleased. Yeah. So remembering that, 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 that the, the things belong to somebody and that they are, there is a copyright, there is a ownership mm. um, because we forget because it's only cross stitch. People don't realise they're ta actually taking someone's salary away. You mm. wouldn't do it to somebody working in Sainsbury's, would you? Wouldn't take their money out of their pocket. No. But people do play shenanigans with cross stitch patterns, and of course, if they're all free on the internet as well. Yeah. I mean, somebody photocopied my sampler book and put it on YouTube. Oh right! Wow. The whole book. Yeah, brilliant. Every page. Yeah. That is illegal. I discovered that you can, if you want to search hard enough, you can download every copy of my magazine for free via a website in Russia. But I'm like, what am I going to do about that? <laughs> it's not absolutely. Like yeah. Absolutely. And unfortunately, it's, it's killed off a, a few magazines mm. where they've gone online, the idea being that, that you would pay your sub. Mm. But you're not supposed to give all your stitching friends the sub, are you? Mm. You, don't, you know, people don't see it as stealing. Yeah. And we're not always very vocal about it. I have a couple of times. I've never minded when I've been to an event and there's someone's got their work up for sale and one or two of them are mine. Mm -hmm. I, they've stitched it, they can sell it. Yeah. I do like them to say where the design came from. 
yeah. on the back mm. because I think it's rude not to. Mm. Um, but but to actually just straightly produce things is naughty, mm. and Chinese do it too. Mm. Um, our um, we had a range of mahog not mahogany but uh, resin products, right? Uh, made of resin, obviously made of resin. <laughs> um, we had mahogany coloured and ivory coloured things. Um, and we had a beautiful box that I suppose was so big, a foot across, eight or nine inches, and it had a big embroidered sort of cotton reel as the handle, um, which was about sixty pounds. And I saw it in a Chinese catalogue, right. and I know it was mine because it had my doll's house embroidery hoop, <laughs> okay. and um, yeah. tiny little scissors that I'd used for the mould yeah. were my things. In a strange way, it's a sort of a claim because you're like yes. imitation and well, they would say flattery. flattery yeah. Yes. Um, so um, yes. Well, listen. Thank you for giving me your time. Thank you for everything you've done around across it. Thank you for being. I don't think you realise that you were sort of mentor to me for the past uh, quite a few years Sweet. now. You or something. silly boy! I don't believe a word of it. Well, no, because you've been. I re I still remember. 2011 knitting and stitching show at Olympia. Stitch, stitch and paper, that one. Yes. Yeah. And I was like next to you and I was like, that's Jane Greenoff. <laughs> like, she's going to hate me because I've got all this weird stuff. And you're no, lovely. We all are merrier. Lovely ever since. And stuff like that. No, I love it. We're absolutely all the merrier, really. No, uh, and have a go on Sewing Street. Yes, we'll Try talk text about you that. Some details. We'll talk about that some more. Yeah. Let me, um, yeah. But yeah, just thank you for being part of this. That's and all right, old thing. Just, just tell me, actually, for the YouTubers, where they can find you online. Where's the best place to find you? Well, janegreenoff.com mm -hmm. is very easy. Yeah. Um, that's where Finders is. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, I'm working for the Cross Stitch Guild, and I, I, I do a, every newsletter that Andrea sends out. So it's not the magazine, but the, the, the digital newsletter. There's a little free chart from me. So that's every month. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I write for the magazine as well um, and appear to be continuing to do so. We had the usual conversation about my, my retirement. And she mm -hmm. says, I've got to stay till I'm 90, okay. which is a further 20 years. Marvellous. <laughs> as long as she keeps... Well, no, you do. You, you, you have to. You have to do it until you drop. I think it's. Yes, I think until it doesn't work for me anymore. Yeah. You know, um, and um, and thinking of things and playing, going out buying for treasures for for my new new exciting hat, which Bill, you know, he agreed in principle to so that I could sell my books online. Mm -hmm. That was the point. Yeah, the reason. Okay. Yeah. And he's very excited by what's happened. Excellent. Very excited. But so that's what good. I love is the fact you can still tell you've still got glint in your eye all about this. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Certainly have. Excellent. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. That's all right, my dear. Bye. So there you have it. Wasn't that a great interview? Honestly, Jane, she's so lovely. She's done so much for the world of cross stitch. It's remarkable, you know. You just have to look on, I don't know, any decent bookseller to see how many books she's produced. Visit the Cross Stitch Guild website to see the plethora of patterns she's created. She's just fantastic. I could spend all day talking with her. I mean, we did talk a lot more outside of the video as well, you know, because, yeah, I've known her. I love her family. They're great people. So I hope you enjoyed that. And like I say, be sure to check out the other videos in the series here. And uh, let me know in the comments what you thought of the video. If there are any designers you'd like me to interview in the future. There are more videos planned. So keep that notification bell hit. And then I'll make sure that you know when the next ones happen. But thanks for taking the time to listen. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll catch you in the next one. Take care everybody. Happy stitching.